This next segment is going to be really, really important. I can't wait for you to learn from the many CEOs and business thinkers that we will be introducing to you. They are enormously experienced individually and collectively it's going to make for two hours of incredible, incredible conversation. And I think 2020 has, as I've already said, compelled all of us to think innovatively about what it means to do business differently to how we have approached it thus far. Many writers, many thinkers, you heard from Prof. Mark Kramer this morning, have been articulating some of these concepts for the longest. And I think what our generation of leadership is called upon to do, whether it be in media, civil society, in corporate, in government, is to reduce that gap between the normative vision of shared value leadership and the actual everyday reality so that it's not just PR spin. This is not just what you spray paint in the foyer of your business, but actually these are values that you are living and breathing as a corporate citizen in the globe. So that's the backdrop to this particular discussion. I have said before that a conversation like this is not possible without sponsorship. Those are the nuts and bolts that make it possible for us to be here. And we are really lucky that we have had some fantastic sponsorship behind today's event and for the next couple of days as well. And I want to thank our sponsors for doing so. And in particular, um, our main sponsor, Old Mutual, that has been absolutely stellar in partnering to make sure that we bring you this conversation around shared values and um, in particular, what it means for us to think through uh, from a leadership point of view what the concept of shared value means. In that regard, there's someone I want to introduce you to before I introduce the rest of the panel and tell you how we're going to proceed. And the person I want to introduce you is the official host of the CEO Lunch. The official host of the CEO Lunch is, of course... Um, Ian Williamson. Mr. Williamson is the Chief Executive Officer of Old Mutual. Ian has a long track record with this organization. He's been with them, if memory serves, at least since 1993, and over the years have played many roles here in South Africa, as well as abroad. Ian has been, for example, also in more recent years, looking after the emerging uh, markets as the Finance Director, critically important role since 2015, Chief Operating Officer in 2017, and um, Interim Chief Executive Officer uh, 2017. So Ian, you are perfectly positioned to be hosting this and be in conversation with the rest of the C-suite that we have that will be with us uh, for the next little while or so. Let's just make sure technology holds. Um, by the way, thank you so much for your generosity. Wherever in the world you are listening and viewing today, um, I think the sound and the quality has been fantastic. We are using the webinar partnership today, of course, of Microsoft Teams. There have been one or two glitches, but the content has been so amazing that just watching your comments, it's clear that there's incredible, incredible generosity. I want to see whether Ian and I can hear each other. Good morning to you, Ian. Good morning, Eusebius. I can hear you perfectly. The audio is fantastic and I can see you well too. Thank you so much for, firstly, for your sponsorship as the main sponsor. And in that regard, let me ask you a question. Why is this summit so important for Old Mutual? Why is it so critically important? There are many things you could do. You could be sitting in your garden reading. You could be worried about what to do about growing a business during a pandemic and an economic recession that preceded it. Why is it so important for Old Mutual to actually take seriously an event of this nature? Oh, thanks, you see, but I think shared value as a principle is something we've embedded in our business for a long time, but formally uh, since around 2017, where we, we adopted you know, Michael Porter's actual framework as a way of guiding our thinking. So I think really just to something that we really believe in and something that you would have heard some of the panelists during the course of the morning from Old Mutual talk about mm. and talk about the extent to which we've tried to, you know, move our conversation from um, community involvement in a sense after the profit line to uh, a real integrated approach. And so, you know, sponsoring this event makes sort of logical, coherent sense in mm. that that framework of something that we fundamentally believe in and something that we use to actually drive the framework of much of what we do in our business. Absolutely. Why don't we get stuck into the first substantive issue that I want us all to discuss? Because of the pandemic, there's this tension that we've often find in discourse, not just in South Africa, but around the region and also in the globe, Ian, where we've put it public health imperatives against the economy. And I'm not sure if it's a false dichotomy, 
Sometimes dichotomies are useful because they're easy to play with, but they can also belie complexity in the universe. Yesterday in South Africa, we have gone from lockdown level 4 to lockdown level 3. So more industry has been opened up. Millions more people have now gone back to work. What are your reflections on that? Is it the right time to be increasing economic activity, or do you think that we have paid insufficient attention to make sure that the public health system is fit enough for millions of people to be back within commerce? Well, I think the science tells us that the, the, the effect of the lockdown is really simply to delay things. And until such time as we have a vaccine or some meaningful form of treatment for COVID-19, that we, you know, at, as, as a globe, we need to learn to live with this thing. And so to me, you know, the lockdown was really a mechanism to buy time. Uh, to allow us to equip our health systems and our other systems to to deal with the inevitable consequences of a certain proportion of the population becoming infected and ill. Hmm. Um, so I think it was the right thing to do, and I do think that African governments generally around the continent, including South Africa, responded well and, and early, uh, which is a positive. Having said that, one then needs to, you know, use that time that we bought to to do the necessary preparation. And having economies locked down and the level of depression and economic activity we've seen also can't go on indefinitely. So Absolutely. the judgment calls around how quickly you open up are difficult. But from what I understand, you know, this, the the scientist end of the argument is you've achieved what you needed to achieve with this lockdown, now move on mm. um, in a South African context. So I think moving to level three now, absolutely the right thing to do. I've been agitating a little bit for this for, this for a couple of weeks. Um, but I also think to your earlier question, it's not entirely an either or conversation. It, it is a very complex system with a feedback loop between economic activity, level of social interaction, level of likely infection, and that feedback loop. So I think it is quite a complex system. Yeah. But ultimately, it's down to all of us individually taking responsibility for our fellow beings mm. and in doing the right thing mm. in terms of observing the protocols around social distancing, you know, wearing masks, and, and not for your own sake, but for the sake of all of those around you who you may be potentially infecting. Absolutely. Ian, once again, thank you so much for being the one who's actually hosting this lunch. I'm just moderating this conversation and for Old Mutual for being behind this event. So this is how we're going to proceed. Um, the first time you speak, please introduce yourself. Try and be un-African and keep it pithy. Um, that's not to say we don't want you to acknowledge who you are and what your company is or who your organization is that you are representing. Uh, maybe in just one or two sentences, do that for us. I'm going to ask you to do that periodically during, during our discussion, only because we're learning as we're going along. The particular webinar format that we're using today, some folks who are watching you around the world might not always see at the strap at the bottom of their screens who your names are and your titles. So you'll have an opportunity two or three times to reiterate who it is that you're representing and your title. But the first time you do, just give us a couple of sentences doing that. Secondly, please make sure that you keep, of course, the camera on all the time. We'd like to see you um, throughout this discussion. When you are not speaking, put your microphone on mute. And then when you are speaking, then obviously make sure that it's not on mute. And then I'm going to be, I've got a screen here where I can see everyone. And I'm also learning with this technology like you in real time. It's the first time that I'm virtually hosting an event, which is going to be the new normal. Hopefully it will also save us all money and be good for the carbon footprint in the long run. Um, use the digital hand, just click on it. And then I know that you want to speak when you do that. And um, that that's, that's fantastic. I'm horrible with names. I know who all of you are. I'm in awe of your achievements. But over the course of the next uh, hour and a half or so, we'll get to know each other a little bit uh, more intimately. And we're just going to have a free flowing discussion. And we'll see how it goes. And, um, you know, if there are gremlins that pop up, we'll deal with them as and when as and when that happens. If you are one of the participants who's watching around the world. Um, if we have time, we'll take questions. I like 
as much of a participati participatory dialogue as possible. And my team here, that's absolutely amazing here in Johannesburg, will signal to me if there's an opportunity for us to also call up some of the questions that are popping up, particularly if some are recurring and those patterns mean there's some urgent issues, not on my mind, but on your mind, wherever home is for you as you are watching and listening to this conversation. So those are the rules of engagement. I'll role model how to keep it pithy. Um, if you do not know me, that's perfectly fine. I am Eusebius McKaiser. I'm a broadcaster. I am an author and I'm a philosophy lecturer and I'm based here in Johannesburg and I have the distinct pleasure today of a day off my day job and having this far more enriching uh, conversation, don't say that to my radio listeners, learning and listening very closely to the excellent, excellent speakers and panelists uh, that Tiki Barnard and her team with uh, the help of Old Mutual have put together for us. So I'm just going to keep it open and whoever puts up their hand first can be our first speaker. Tell us your name, who you represent and answer for me the same question that I had put to Ian because I think that is a question that immediately is a question that all of you in positions of leadership have to deal with. Have we got that balance right between thinking through the economic challenges of our countries and on the other hand, we are told that compared to the global north, we cannot afford to have increased economic activity because if countries like Italy, countries like the USA are unable to deal with the public health burden that comes with COVID-19, then apparently in Africa, we are told we should be even more cautious uh, because our systems aren't fit to be able to deal with high volumes of people that may need access to public health care in the, in the immediate term, not even in the medium to long term. What are some of your thoughts there and your reactions to what Ian had said? Anyone can start us off. I'm not a bully. However, if there is total silence, I will volunteer on your behalf. Um, if I can, it's just happened to be randomly the first name that uh, my eyes are falling on, um, is Hilton. Hilton, why don't you clear your throat for me? Tell us who you are um, and what your thoughts are around this particular question. Um, thanks, Eusebius. Uh, so, so, as you said, uh, Hilton Kellner, I'm the CEO of, uh, of Discovery um, in South Africa, and uh, and you know I think it's a t the reason why I think there was that sort of immediate silence is because nobody knows the answer. This is uh, this is one of those this is one of those questions that that uh, that 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 is is completely uncertain. We're in uncharted territory. We track we track the numbers daily. We plugged into the pathology systems. You know we cover. Um, for those people that are that are watching um, across the globe, uh, Discovery is the biggest private health insurer in uh, in South Africa. We cover about three and a half million um, lives, um, and we also have we also have a, a very large um, life insurance um, life insurance business. And and so we are sort of intimately involved in uh, in in measuring, analysing, understanding the trends. And and the one thing we know for certain is that up until this point, our government has done a great job. In terms of in terms of the steps taken um, around the lockdown, the uh, the the trade-off between health and the economy is is one which just doesn't have just doesn't have a right or wrong answer. I think Ian uh, Ian made uh, Ian made that point, and that's the that's the trade-off that we that we sort of and the tightrope uh, the tightrope that we're now walking. Um, I think what it does require is is agility, the ability to pull back, um, the ability to sort of move forward. And to do so based on on sort of the the data on the ground, um, the one thing I think that every country around the world has seen is that the healthcare systems are not equipped and are not adequate to be able to handle the numbers that that are that are coming. And I think it's difficult to it's difficult for any any society to sort of interpret that while while the hospitals themselves are not full. And uh, and so I think as long as you have that that sort of scenario, there's always going to be pressure to to sort of loosen. The, uh, the the lockdown um, and and sort of a a difficulty in in sort of uh, suppressing economic activity while there's still capacity in the healthcare system and I think that's the that's the sort of the the complexity that uh, that we face with um, against every single global benchmark what we're seeing is that is that the steps taken thus far are 
worst person. And, and, and now I think it's that sort of that um, uh, phasing in of, uh, of economic activity that will, I think, ultimately determine how we judged in terms of how we've managed the, uh, the, the pandemic. So, so I guess um, the, the, the complexity that, that everybody is faced with now is simply in, in how that's being managed. From our perspective, what we're trying to do is keep all of our people at home as much as possible. Mm. That's not just for their sake, but for the sake of the people that we have in the office as well. So I think what we have seen is that, is that the, the sort of the, the work environment is very, very difficult to, to control um, when you do have, when you do have uh, people infected. Um, and therefore, the, the best action that we can take at the moment is for our people, keep them at home and, and, and adopt as far as possible a work from home uh, approach. We've moved, we moved about 9,000 people. Um, to uh, to to work from home and and that's that that's worked exceptionally well. Absolutely. Um, for our clients, mm. for our clients, what we've done is is sort of risk rated them um, using our data to be able to understand who are most at risk um, if they are infected of developing complications and reaching out to them positively and educating them through that process um, and around the steps to take and where people are infected, give them the best tools possible. To be able to to be able to manage um, their, uh, their their condition, so yeah. so these are tough times. Yeah, Peter, um, maybe you can come in here, Hilton. Well, that makes absolute sense. There is a weird gift that we have for the rest of the universe as Africans, um, and that is that we've dealt so much with infectious diseases. We've had to deal with everything from HIV, AIDS to Ebola to tuberculosis as well. And so I wonder, despite the fact that we are having this existential crisis as a globe around this question that Hilton has spoken into so beautifully with Ian around the complexity, how do we tackle it, Peter? What comes up for you as you listen to the two other panelists? members thus far. Please start off firstly by just introducing us to you. Peter, can you hear me? Okay, if Peter can't, anyone else can jump in. I can. Is it... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. Thank you, Eusebia, Sander. Thank you, uh, Hilton, and, and, and also Ian. Uh, so my name is uh, Peter Ndegwa. I am the new CEO uh, of uh, Safaricom. Safaricom is the largest uh, telecommunication business in Eastern Africa, but also owns uh, the, the largest mobile uh, provider, uh, mobile money provider uh, called M-Pesa. Uh, so, so actually we are in the heart of uh, everything that's going on at, the, at this stage in terms of we are an essential service during this period. Uh, so our primary objective is, of course, to keep the country connected, but also to prevent infection, to, al to allow people to, uh, to actually do commerce and, and uh, uh, connect together. We're also using M-Pesa uh, as a way of enabling the economy to operate. I think the second is, last year we were the host, uh, and I want to recognize uh, the late uh, Bob Colimo, who actually gave the keynote uh, speech in Nairobi, uh, and, uh, and this whole area of... Uh, uh, shared value, it was an area that he was very passionate uh, about. And Safaricom has been known to, as, as a business that uh, really shares that. Just coming, coming to the topic, I, I think the, um, within the Africa uh, environment, and, uh, and in Kenya and the African environment, it is quite fair to say that although this is a, a health uh, crisis, it is much more of a social and economic crisis. Uh, we look at M-Pesa, M-Pesa is almost with what we call a barometer of what's happening in the economy. So we can see 25 million people uh, using M-Pesa and their habits. And also we can see 170,000, what we call Lipana M-Pesa, pay with M-Pesa merchants. And we can see the level of economic activity. And also with um, a mobile business, uh, we can also see how people are actually relating. We know that there's a lot of jobs that have been lost uh, during this period. We know SMEs are under pressure. So although this is a health crisis, actually it's much more an economic issue. So the passage of time uh, is, is there's a balance between keeping oxygen in the economy, so to say, uh, and actually keeping people safe. Uh, so, so as the two speakers have actually said, look, we do need to, uh, to take the learnings during the partial cost uh, shutdown, which we have seen in Kenya, 
and uh, there have been different versions of Shan across Africa. Uh, but in Kenya, we've been able to learn a lot. Mm. Uh, we can use the period that uh, we have taken to learn uh, to be able to operate in a much more systematic way, but in a way that allows us to keep our employees safe and also our customers safe. So for our business, for example, 70% of our employees are working from home. Because we are an essential service, we have our frontline working. So we've learned how to keep our employees safe but at the same time serve customers uh, because we can't forget customers during this period and we have to enable the economy. One of the areas we are thinking about is SMEs as a big area. How do we support the recovery process mm. through supporting SMEs together with others through partnership, collaboration, innovation during this period so that we can enable the country to come back? Okay, so please don't wait, wait for me to prompt you to speak. Just put up your hand. We're all being very polite, um, living up to that positive stereotype about Africans. So if you do want to come to the conversation, please do so. The last person I'm going to deliberately prompt is Ifi Yinwa to please introduce ourselves to you. And maybe let's also mess the conversation up a bit. We can have an entirely dynamic conversation. I want to know what it's like, particularly as a CEO. I mean, we're talking here about the burdens of the state, but the very first point that, that, was, that was raised um, by, by Hilton was that perhaps one of the reasons, besides the fact that virtual summons are new, one reason for the initial silence is that no one has the answers. And it raises a really interesting question. How does one, as leadership, take decisions under conditions of profound uncertainty when you have citizens or in the corporate space, stakeholders, customers, consumers who are looking to you for answers. I mean, after all, you've got the title of CEO. And um, just as a mom or a dad has to learn to role model to a child that just the fact that you are mom or dad doesn't mean that you are the fountain of wisdom. There are things you don't know. What is it like right now? during this pandemic with so much scientific uncertainty to be in a leadership position and being called upon to take decisions under conditions of extreme uncertainty. If he in what? So is the volume okay? It's beautiful. Go ahead. Thank you so much for having me, and it's a pleasure to be with you all. My name is Ifeinwa Ugochuku, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Tony Elimelu Foundation. The Tony Elimelu Foundation is a Pan-African philanthropy that has, uh, in the last five years, launched a $100 million commitment to identify, train, fund, and mentor 10,000 African entrepreneurs across all 54 African countries. And um, to date, we have already... Uh, nearly met our target. We've uh, trained and funded over 9,000 African entrepreneurs. So your, your question is very apt because uh, beyond uh, our team members, uh, we have thousands uh, of African entrepreneurs uh, really looking to us for questions in this very difficult time. And one thing is clear is that um, Africa is clearly the epicenter for the economic devastation of the COVID pandemic. Mm. We've seen We've seen entire industries ground to a halt. And um, Africa is estimated that the pandemic will push an additional 23 million people into extreme poverty. That is very serious for a, co a continent that um, uh, oftentimes has been battling on two fronts during this period. We battle not just the COVID pandemic, but also the hunger pandemic. One of the first things that uh, uh, was highlighted during the lockdown was the fact that how do you ask uh, uh, millions who live in very cramped spaces mm. and depend on our daily movement for their everyday uh, uh, earnings in order to put food on the table? How do you ask them to sit at home without food in the fridges or without food to eat? And so we found that food systems, food security is a very clear and present challenge in the African economy. Mm. So we are dealing with um, over 250 million uh, young people who depend on the informal uh, 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 employment in the urban sectors from small and medium enterprises. And so the small and medium enterprises do not have the shock absorbers that the big companies have. Mm. So 
the COVID pandemic has, has revealed the underbelly of Africa, which is the fact that we have a very fragile economy that isn't as developed as the Western world. Because we know that in the West, as people were asked to stay at home, they were giving palliatives. They were given, you know, thousands of dollars paid into accounts so that they could be able to stay at home. We do not have that in Africa. And so our solution has to be unique to us. Our solution has to take into, into uh, has to take um, cognizance of the fact that Africa is unique. Africa has very unique socioeconomic landscape. And if we are going to come out of this, we need to dig deep and we need to leverage our inborn resilience. And that is the message that we have given to our entrepreneurs, to our team members, to our ecosystem. Steve Jobs, one of his favorite quotes is that innovation is the ability to see change and challenges as an opportunity and not as a threat. And that is what we must see the COVID pandemic for Africa, that it is a unique opportunity for us all to pause, for us all to rethink our way of doing things and to reprioritize, to reprioritize those shared social values, to, re to reprioritize uh, um, you know, empowerment of the most vulnerable in our, in our communities, to reprioritize food security, to reprioritize and know that our focus must be the real economy and not the finance-driven economy. Our focus has to be on productivity. Our focus has to be on, 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 on you know, human development and human capital. And so to answer your question, how have we, how have we in a time that's been so much uncertainty shared the message of hope. Um, that is one thing that our foundation is based on. Mm. Uh, our, our, our belief that the private sector has the power to transform Africa, has the power to, to catalyze economic development. And so this message for us is, has never been more important than now. And that is what we're sharing with our team members, with our entrepreneurs, and with the entire uh, stakeholders. Last week, our founder, Mr. Tony Elimelu, um, led a high-level panel comprising the uh, president of Liberia, the administrator of the UNDP, Akim Steiner, uh, the secretary general of the African Caribbean uh, Pacific Nations. And one of the things that stood out, uh, President Orama of Africa in Bank was also there. One of the things that stood out is that there has never been a time to come together as Africans than now. We need to create a global, uh, an African response to, to the COVID pandemic. We need to leverage the lessons learned and see it as an opportunity to catalyze activity. Take, for instance, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. We have, we're at a crossroads. We can either leverage the, 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 this period as a catalyst to accelerate the implementation, or we can allow uh, this period to be a tranquilizer that leads us into the death sleep of inaction. The I, point is, yeah. innovation is the yeah. key. And we must focus on what we can do. And now more than ever, we're able to stay connected. Look at this event, for instance. Mm. Usually it would take all of us carving three days out of our schedule, getting on a plane to be together. But now, just by the click of a button, we're all together. We're able to connect. How do we leverage these powerful connections Absolutely. to, to, to point yeah. a, 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 a very united challenge to the problem? I think mm. together we can leverage this to see much more development across our continent. Yeah, thanks so much for that, if I know much appreciated. Rebecca, maybe I can bring you in here. I desperately want to agree with her. I love the fact that there's positive energy, solutions-driven, that we have faith if we are to believe your fellow panelists in the possibility that even private enterprise can be leveraged for the purposes of creating value that in turn can then become shared value. And... And then there's the skeptic in me that's just inherent in my background as a philosophy student that questions everything. And I think to myself, but what about the track record, though? It's very often been businesses that have had their proboscis in communities taken rather than shared the value that is extracted. It has often been business that has been in cahoots with governments around the region that have created kleptocratic relationships that haven't benefited the citizens of Africa. And in that scenario, there is, to borrow from a title of one of our earlier panels, a gap between shared value almost as a norm or a vision 
and and a, and a reality of millions of African citizens still waiting for Uhuru. And I wonder whether you share the optimism of what you've just heard there, Rebecca. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor for me to participate in this webinar. My name is Rebecca Miano. I am the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Kenya Electricity Generating Company, which we call Kenjen. Kenjen is the leading electricity generator in the country, currently producing about 70% of all the electricity that is consumed in the country. And we have various sources of generation, including hydro, geothermal. We have a bit of wind. We also have thermal. But I'm glad to say that currently we have over 85% in renewable and green energy, and the remaining 15% then from non-renewable sources. But the government is determined to pull up the numbers and probably in the coming years be 100% renewable energy. And electricity generation is an essential service. Just like Safaricom said, we are at the heart of it, making sure the economy is moving, making sure the health facilities are working, and even the connectivity that Safaricom has is supported by electricity. And I like what you asked about leadership at a time like this, and what a time to be a leader, juggling a lot of complex and intricate balances. And for us here at Kenjin, considering that we are an essential service, we operate machines which we cannot operate from home. And when there is that this rallying call that stay at home, work from home, so what do I do? I cannot stay at home. I have to convince my team, but nonetheless, we are an essential service. But in terms of leadership, I see it as a time, as a leader, where you have to stand out as a real role model. We have read books, we have been using phrases, but nature has given us an opportunity to really test what we believe in that. Have to remain the hope giver, you have to be the leader that people trust but everything you do. Mm. You have to keep people focused, good communication. You've got to be on top of things such that you are the source of reliable, reliable communication. You do not fret. You're not afraid because everybody is looking at you. I've also seen that it is a time that we cannot afford to excuse indiscipline or let lack of accountability reign in the excuse of a pandemic, but a time to ensure that we continue to deliver, we continue delivering on our goals and keeping the country moving forward. And we have a three-pronged approach in this responding to the pandemic. One of it is to guarantee electricity supply, no matter what. <laughs> this involves then putting your shifts in the right place, having some people that are isolated in case there is infection, and all those tidying up things that we have to do it while ensuring we are compliant with the measures given. Then we have social support, our operations are located within communities and we cannot succeed if we do not partner with the communities. So we have the whole of these operations working together with the communities, supporting them, having awareness, providing them with all the necessities that are required. And again, it's a time to put in place our community engagement strategy in real time and so that has been very good for us. And in the short term, we are also reducing 
expenditure, reallocating resources, and sort of working on our processes and systems. ICT has come in big time, things that we took for granted. Every meeting was physical. And so it's a sort of turnaround. Mm. And I see going forward, it has to be start of a transformation in the way we do business, not only here in Kenjan, but I think across the country, across Africa, and across the globe. Rebecca, thank you so much for that. Um, there's a video I want to play, but before I do that, Faith, I want to bring you into the conversation just to react to what you've heard so far. I've got to confess as a South African, while I'm listening to Rebecca, I almost stopped listening after I started salivating at the phrase, um, roughly a secure supply of electricity. That's certainly something that I wouldn't mind um, as a citizen of this country, but it's critically important. It's really interesting listening to uh, the importance of making sure that the fundamentals of business are still in place because it's very easy to say, no, you just have to m make sure that you get the cost curve to be as, you know, as small as possible, divest, divest, divest. Um, we see it in economies here in South Africa at the moment, a lot of job insecurity that happens. And yet that isn't the message that I'm getting as I'm listening to Rebecca there, that actually um, there are always winners and losers during a crisis. And ironically enough, uh, the winners, if Rebecca is to be believed, are those who actually stick to the fundamentals of what business is about. What are some of your early thoughts that have come up for you as you've listened to the other panel members so far? Faith? No, thank you very much, uh, Eusebius, and uh, good afternoon to my pan panelists, and I'm really excited to be part of this panel. Um, just to introduce myself uh, briefly, you see this? So my name is Faith and I run um, WTP Investment Holdings. We are a women-owned and led um, uh, organization and uh, we have been uh, operating uh, since 1991. And really we were founded with a mission in, in, in mind and our mission was to advance uh, women uh, in this economy. So I think, you know, for me, when we talk about shared value, it's something that has always been uh, in the DNA of, uh, of our organization. And I'm very excited that actually business is now moving towards thinking about not just shareholders, but actually thinking about all the stakeholders that impact the bottom line uh, of business. So I'm really excited. But I mean, I think if I look at, you know, how this pandemic, you know, has impacted, you know, not just our business, but obviously also South Africa and, uh, and humanity, I really want to agree, you see, because with my panelists, that I think this is the time uh, to reset. And I think we've talked a lot as South Africans and as Africans, we be, we're very good at talking, <laughs> but now it's about taking actions because I think we've realized that, you know, this, this pandemic has laid bare some of the deep inequalities, for example, uh, that really this continent and humanity uh, uh, faces. And I really believe that business has got a huge role to play in looking at different economic models that are more inclusive, you know, mm -hmm. because without having an inclusive, um, you know, business model, we are not going to address, you know, the, the inequalities, the economic inequalities that, you know, that, uh, that we face as a continent, but also globally. I mean, we've seen what is happening in America as well. So I think that, you know, this pandemic, and I agree with my uh, panelists that it's time for reflection. It's time for, for us to look, you know, to look very deep inside of ourselves, but also look at what we as leaders can do differently to really be the change that we want to see. Because, I mean, I think for us, we cannot accept that, you know, we've got people that are, are running around hungry, chasing for food, while this continent, I mean, we are one of the, you know, we, we've got wealth, you know, but this wealth, unfortunately, is not being distributed fairly. So I really, you see, because I really pray that, you know, mm. this is going to be a wake-up call for all of us, that our consciousness as leaders is really raised, but you know, it doesn't end there, you know, it, it, we have to take action. And it's, it's government, it's business, it's civil society. I think this is the time for us 
to really just research and rethink and really just take, you know, action that is different from the action mm. that, you know, we've even like taken about three months ago. So I think it's Faith, very can exciting. I, that can I just stick with you? Yes. I want to ask you a follow-up question before I play the video. And then after that, we'll bring in other voices that we haven't heard yet. But I want to stick with you for just one minute. It's not like if we take a long view of history and of leadership, both in the state as well as civil society, business, academia, so all leadership, not just business leadership, nor only state. We don't have to be state-centric in our analyses. It's not like the world has been short historically of opportunity for us to understand that our fate is tied together. And yet we keep dropping the ball and learning lessons over and over again. Why do you think, if you do, this pandemic and this moment of 2020 may well be different or Mother Nature is maybe forcing us to be different, because we may as well have asked, what was the lessons learned from, I don't know, 9-11, for example, World War II, depending on how long a view of history you want to take. And as human mm. beings, sociologically, we don't seem to be very good at learning lessons. I think this time around, you know, uh, you see, because I think this pandemic has... I think it has really equalized us. And I think it has, you know, it has also shown how uh, united we are. Because, I mean, obviously this started in China and all of a sudden, you know, it it, it is in Africa and, and South Africa. And I think when it started, we actually thought it was a Chinese issue. But I think, so I think that is maybe the key difference with Sibia said. It's, for me, it's been an equalizer. It really has just shown that, you know, as humanity... You know, we actually are one, and we are we are quite, uh, you know, frail. And I think, you know, and I think we've learned to, you know, to pull together. And uh, but also, I think there's been, I mean, I think the economic destruction uh, that has uh, come with this pandemic. I'm also hoping that you know it's teaching us a lesson or two about you know how we really have to start, you know, you know, to pull together. So that's really, I think probably Eusebius is more of a hope, but I just think that, you know, also the way we have responded as, as humanity, as, as states around the world has been different because I think we've really tried to, you know, to club together. Of course, there has been exceptions, sure. but, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, sort of like in general, there really has been that sort of like, you know, coming together for a solution as humanity and really just trying to see how we can work together to deal with the pandemic. 100%. There's a video that I want us to play. Um, a key part of the CEO lunch is to reflect on a couple of words in the title. The words are chosen very carefully. I know that Tiki spends a lot of time, Tiki Barnard, thinking deliberately about the conceptualization of what it is that we are engaged in today in the next couple of days, purposeless leadership. And there are few thinkers of our time as absolutely, absolutely brilliant um, as Mike Porter, Michael Porter, who, who can really give us material with which to reflect and to think on. This morning we had uh, Prof Kramer, but I want us to listen to this video very carefully, and then we will segue out of this video into a next couple of meaty themes that I want to pick up on based on this, on this four-minute clip. I think we all know that purpose has become a very rapidly growing area of discussion and focus on the part of business leaders around the world. Um, it's truly an inflection point for that whole concept, which was introduced a number of years ago uh, by Larry Fink in a, in a letter to virtually every CEO of a major company. Uh, but ultimately, it started out sort of as an abstract idea. I think now what's starting to happen is people are trying to engage in actually doing something. And uh, interestingly, uh, the COVID crisis has elevated even more the interest and the focus on this idea. Uh, because today, uh, companies feel that they must uh, see a purpose and be able to articulate that purpose to their customers. And customers today expect this. And they feel that any company today, given the environment we're in, needs to make a positive contribution not just think narrowly in traditional ways about profit or, or shareholder value. However, uh, even with the best of intentions, the idea of purpose is still not clear. Uh, there's a lack of clarity about what it is, what it means. 
and even more clear, uh, confusion about what to do to actually achieve it. So to make purpose powerful, to make it matter, as opposed to just be a slogan or a buzzword or a declaration of you know, good intentions, um, uh, to make purpose powerful, it must be involving creating shared value. Uh, it's not just the company giving something to society or contributing something to society. That isn't powerful enough. What we've learned is that if we really want to make uh, move the needle on societal issues and societal problems, we need to do it through the business, uh, using the business itself as part of strategy. And that makes purpose, first of all, well implemented, but it also makes it scalable. If you're using a profitable business model to deliver your purpose, then you can deliver that purpose as much as you want to as many people as possible. Uh, it's only your energy that limits you, uh, not, not any economics. So uh, shared value is critical at this moment because it's, it's, it's an idea that's been around for some time, but it's providing really the deeper way of understanding how to make purpose matter. And uh, of course, we've had a lot of buzzwords in this general field of social impact, like uh, uh, you know, uh, double bottom line, and 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 you know, uh, win win, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, all those phrases have come and gone. But the purpose to make purpose powerful, we have to turn it into something real, turn it into something tangible. Um, so the purpose is, is, the, is the why should companies do something? And the, the most common definition of that is this is our fundamental reason for being. Um, that's kind of the, if I had to pick one way of defining purpose now that's used in practice, it would be that. Uh, so, what, so we decide what our fundamental reason for being in, and that's got to be connected to our business. Uh, it can't just be a, a random good thing to do. Um, and then the shared value part is the how. How do we go about uh, benefiting society and moving the needle on an important social issue through the business with a business model so that we can scale it and improve it and drive it over time? That's, uh, that's ultimately the, the combination that we have to put in place in more and more organizations. It's, it's happening, but there's a, there's a long way to go. And all of you, uh, uh, part of this session today, uh, are, are going to be the key actors in that process. That was absolutely stunning. Stephen, can I invite you to engage there? There's so much to pick up on there. Maybe just uh, two things certainly landed for me. I love identity questions. It's just something I do as a writer. And the idea that purpose isn't just about an instrumental goal, but fundamentally it has to do with, you know, what your fundamental reason for being is. That's a deeply existential question to ask yourself as a corporate citizen, as a state, and as a mortal during these uh, difficult times when we don't know what's going to happen next. And then the shared value part is the how. If we take those concepts, Stephen, but we make them our own for the African region, Firstly, tell us who you are, introduce us to yourself and to your company. And then secondly, how do you think about purpose? Purpose for your organization, and um, even if you do it extemporaneously, how do you think about purpose for, for the region during this time? What is our purpose? What are we called upon to think of as our purpose in 2020? Stephen? Thank you so much, and thanks to my colleagues, the panelists, and for giving me this opportunity to share with you my view in this period of crisis. It's very hard to come up with a convincing answer, proposal, proposition during the crisis. But nevertheless, this is when you decide or you uh, engage and weigh if leadership is doing the right things. If I go direct to your position, uh, apologies. Um, I am Stephen, as you have introduced rightly, and I'm a CEO of a private sector federation in Rwanda. Uh, private sector federation is an apex body of a business uh, membership organization here. In other countries, it is called the Chamber of Commerce, but us, we are autonomous and independent uh, organ that we represent the members. And it is during this period that when, then you see if we are contributing relevantly to the community, both business community and the ordinary citizens. 
Uh, the question, uh, how do you drive the purpose at the moment is a difficult one, but I will try to give it a go. If you wanted to see the purpose uh, in a bigger context is you do to yourself or to others what you would want to be done to you. That is the purpose. If the positions were changed and you are at the receiving end, is what you're receiving, what you would really, in the normal circumstances, and even extraordinary circumstances like this one, is what you're receiving. If I give an example, during this crisis in Rwanda, the business community had a hand. Normally, it is not their responsibility, per se. During this crisis, the members of business community contributed both in cash and in kind towards to their government to fight or try to manage the crisis. Business had closed, movement had come to the standstill. People were staying at home. And as you know, the structure of Africa, the biggest uh, population is unemployed. They have casual laborers who have to, to feed themselves, they're working hard. So the business community had to come up and with proposals and solutions, and they contributed uh, towards the survival or no, dialect data at the moment. In terms of the purpose of an organization, I'll compare it with a, an ICU, an intensive care unit in a hospital. Where you get someone from uh, operation theater and expect to find a supporting machine working during the crisis. That's when you see the best uh, contribution of a purpose-driven organization. You must support, contribute, encourage, give hope to people coming to you, to people who are beyond your market share, both geographically and in terms of product, to see that this company is relevant not only for this period of trial, but even in the future. The generation that is coming, after this existing generation, we receive the contribution of this company. Today, we don't know if the cause of this crisis is either because of artificial intelligence or climate change, but it could be both because the world is going through a number of challenges. But the thing is, it is happening. So how do you adjust even your structured value, emissions, uh, no, all these corporate uh, values to fit this kind of uh, life we are in. So the best definition of a purpose, a driven purpose, or the shared value contribution of an organization, one is to be flexible. Mm. Two is to stay ahead of the challenges and contribute to the best uh, uh, of your level in terms of the community, the mass, basically, so that they have to see you as part of them, mm. not as someone who's taking from them. You will see corporates have in their action plans and strategies, CRA, uh, the social corporate responsibilities. Fine, that has been there for centuries, but is it done in the right way? If it wasn't there, would the community still come to you even when you are not contributing? So those are the, the, the way I think uh, the purpose or the, the, the value. Basically, it is very hard sure. to distinguish between purpose and value. Yeah. Because I believe they work together. And if one is missing, then the other is not in existence. Stephen, thank, thank you, you for that. I appreciate Stephen, you dealing with that complexity. Ellen, can I ask you to come into the conversation at this point? Um, firstly, I must say, Ellen, you are the perfect person to have as a panel panel member. Your body language um, has been beautifully positive throughout and nodding in agreement with all the insights that you've heard. Um, and thank you for patiently waiting your own turn to come in. You don't have to be patient, by the way. Just put up your hand digitally. But I want you to come in here. A number of speakers, including the academics, have reiterated a practical imperative. We have got to give practical meaning to concepts like shared value and purpose. There's no point in them being highfalutin. We could have a university seminar on what they mean theoretically, but in order to transform the material conditions of society, we've got to give them as much practical volume as possible. How might we do that, even if we don't have all of the answers to the complexities? Well, first, thank you so much for your kind comments. I was sort of laughing because I thought I... Um 
I'm actually here in the United States. And I thought, oh, maybe this is a, I'm the only non-African CEO, I think, invited here. And also I'm having a, a, a sunrise of meeting here instead of a luncheon meeting. Um, but I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I am the CEO of the END Fund. We work on ending neglected tropical diseases and support or, um, local organizations and directly ministries of health in about 25 African countries. We're actually headquartered um, in New York City, which is a hot spot of the COVID pandemic in the United States. Here we just passed 100,000 deaths in this country. Um, we've also been, um, we're on our fifth day of uh, protests against police brutality in the United States. So we are definitely facing a lot of our own issues um, quite in a, in a very intense way. I think what, you know, it's, I want to sort of go back to the beginning of our conversation. I was so struck by this balance between public health and economy and what are the trade-offs there. And part of me, I mean, I work for a public health organization. We're responding directly to COVID. And I think there's also a question of there's a public health and public health trade-off. And what I'm worried about a lot that we're seeing is it was very easy to shut down the economy. It's not easy at all. All of us that were leaders really struggled with when to do that and when to have people work remotely. But the starting again is really difficult. And I'm seeing that from a public health lens that I just yesterday got data about what will the impact be on malaria deaths, on HIV deaths, on TB deaths, on the increase of disease like bilharzia, um, uh, like blinding trachoma, uh, if we don't get back to community-based treatment. And it's devastating. Um, right now, there's a sort of real sense of how do we make sure that we also are preserving the health system and health access that we have worked so hard um, to, to ensure we're already seeing hot spots of uh, schistosomiasis or bilharzia in certain places spike. Um, and, I, and what we're looking for is how do we do all of that safely with additional training, with PPE. I so appreciated um, Ken Jem and um, Safaricom talking about like the essential services and figured out like how to still do these frontline work and be safe. I think we need to think the same way as uh, community health workers are, are essential services. And um, in many places still we haven't figured out how to ensure continuity of care um, to the most vulnerable. Um, I think that there's this idea of purpose. In a, the, I have worked in the nonprofit sector for almost 30 years now, and there's never been a day that we don't think about purpose in the nonprofit sector. You know, we, we work inside of mission-driven, incredibly um, focused on how do you provide social good. But there's been a, a, a desire, I think, in the social sector for all of these decades how do we learn from the private sector? How do we get more efficient? How do we get more targeted? How do we have better KPIs? How can we run nonprofits like we would for profits? And I feel like right now, actually, we need to flip the story. What can for profits learn from not for profits about creating, uh, you know, passionate workforce that's also thinking about social good that does, you know, drive to real um, the, the clarity of, of impacts for not, you know, just shareholders, but broad base of stakeholders. So I really love that this blended learning is happening between our, our different sectors. Um, I think that this is a, I, I love that we're all on a webinar right now. It's so true. I would have flown to Johannesburg for this conference on a, on a, on a usual day and everybody, I think things that I would, have, I would have previously thought would be rude or culturally inappropriate to do by <laughs> webinar. Um, we're all figuring out how to do that now. And actually you're right, reduce our carbon footprint. Um, I also think, I mean, for me personally, reflecting on watching the, Africa response to COVID. I was in Rwanda in February and I, you know, as the world's waking up and thinking, how can we take this uh, more seriously? And I think at the airport, I, you know, was asked questions about who I'd contact. My temperature was taken. There was education materials everywhere. Um, you know, it was like really a deep understanding of what is contact tracing? How do you nip infectious disease in the bud? When I came back to the U.S., there was none of that. And, you know, there is a little bit of, um, you know, I guess part confusion and part just misunderstanding mm. of like why COVID hasn't impacted Africa as much and oh, it's the climate, is it it's different? And I'm like, you know, Africa's really good at dealing with infectious disease. And actually there's something to be quite, you know, proud of in terms of how to show some of that to the rest of the world. I mean, there's a lot of um, conspiracy theories going around here in sure. the U.S. about what contact tracing. And I'm like, contact tracing is basic public health. You know, all of us need to you know, we're becoming amateur epidemiologists and need to keep up that that education. Mm. Uh, so I just am, uh, you know, quite, quite hopeful, actually, for how much African leaders have to show for responsiveness to public health outbreaks, how the corporate sector has really been at the lead uh, of ensuring um, an effective response. 
Um, and I agree that there's uh, just the sense of figuring out how to be really place-based in what our response is to back opening up, because there's a lot of places that really are ready to, yeah. to open up, um, and that needs to be taken seriously. Ellen, so thank, thank you. you for that. That was, that was very incisive. Millions of issues that you raised there worth picking up on, but um, I want to play game, as I promised. Um, the first person who's actually role model how to digitally raise their hand is Marion, and I was going to come to you, Marion. Thank you so much for doing so. Uh, the floor is all yours. Go right ahead. Uh, Spencer, thank you very much for this opportunity and other other panelists. Uh, thank you, Ian, for sponsoring uh, Hilton. And I, I like really what what uh, Peter Degg was said about about um, balancing public health with, with with trade and what they're doing at Safaricom, and also what Rebecca and and uh, Ife Ife Inua quite passionately say, dig deep. And I think this is really the time to dig deep. And 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 thank you to Rebecca and and, and Stephen and Ellen who just came who just came now. Uh, my name is Marion Mwangi. I am the managing director of uh, BUC. BUC is a member of the Linda Group. is the biggest um, oxygen manufacturing company in Kenya. Uh, pure oxygen, 99.95% for hospital use. Um, and BUC is involved in many, many aspects of industry. There's no industry that we don't touch in our, in our, in our aspects. So 50% of our business is, is, is likely the industrial business. And then the other 50% is medical oxygen production and nitrous oxide and other gases that are used in hospitals, um, including including the, the ones that are used to, to manage machines in ICUs and, and other, 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 other special care. So we are an essential services company. Uh, we've been in Kenya for about 80 years, um, and this this time, this this COVID time has really taught us a lot of lessons. So I wouldn't go back to what has been spoken about trading off because you can't really trade off. But I just share with you what, how, how how passionate I'm feeling now about uh, driving purpose to the employees because we've got um, employees who are facing um, uh, facing facing the, the disease itself in hospitals, um, putting up engineering systems to the bed and coming back to work. And one of the things that have, has really, really helped us at POC is to prioritize communication. So even if there's uh, social distancing and other public health measures, we're still having uh, meetings at the car park. So one and a half meters away and just speaking about how do you feel? And because we, ex we want employees to feel that they can still contribute to the, to the purpose that we've set out uh, for ourselves. I mean, we all know that, that uh, oxygen distribution is very low. I mean, the number the numbers are out there and, and accessibility is, is a big issue. So we spinned our, our, our purpose to really go to social good. And I, I like what you learned from Alan on, on, from, from social enterprises. Um, and for, for us personally, and this is, this is actually what Stephen touched on, um, employees identify with things that are simple and purposes that they can relate to. So what we what we have really focused on is the universal law of cause and effect. I think that's that's basically uh, what Stephen brought out from mm. from Rwanda. Um, the three principles really is that there's exactness. If 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 you put in the work now, you're going to get a good result. Um, even if there's a time lag between the time you you, um, you engage with, with hospitals or the decision makers at this time, you will get the result that you've, you've, you've sort of planted. And once you're doing the right thing, you're going to have a multiplier effect. Um, sort of what you say when you plant one apple, you get many, many, many. So this is a time for us to dig deep into our capability and to trust that we're going to have a good multiplier effect if we work together as as um as 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 Kenyans, as Africans, as people who are interested in the mm -hmm. good, in the good of uh, in the good of, of, of the human face, and and for us, we develop virtues around these three principles of exactness, time lag, and and multiply effect, and we discuss them during our town halls. Our colleagues two week two weeks ago uh, moved in on site, and they're living here on site, just to make sure that they don't get infected, and that we can supply oxygen to to the hospitals, mm -hmm. and that for me was just the, the check that our purpose is working mm. because the idea actually came from the shop floor. We say, they said, if one of us tested positive, how would we produce oxygen? How would we save the lives of Kenyans? Mm. And I thought, what a, what a beautiful idea. And, and we accommodated them here now. Um, I, I, I like the, 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 the dialing that we do to them and what they say, the, the reason they're doing that. I don't have to speak about purpose anymore. They are speaking about it with each other. Um, and I think that this conversation, and if, if, if I have, this is my first time to attend this um, 
this forum, I, I would go anytime because this is such a good conversation and I've learned quite a lot. Um, and I hope that this contribution is, is worthwhile. Absolutely it is, Mary, and I can guarantee you. Claire, I want to bring you in here. Um, I want to pick up on something a little bit earlier that Faith had said when I'd asked the question, shouldn't we be skeptical? Human beings, sociologically, have demonstrated across time and place that we don't learn lessons from history. We've been gifted many crises that we have wasted over the years. But of course, we can then demonstrate to future generations how to do it differently. And very often there is a tension that is set up, maybe it's a media fiction, between civil society, business, labor, and government. You've heard from so many of the CEOs over the last uh, hour or so how ready they are to roll up their sleeves and to reconceptualize their place in society because it is fundamentally about recognizing that our fate is tied together regardless of your position and where you are in society. What has come up for you over the last hour in general? And in particular, what more specifically should be the attitude of governments around the continent when they think about big business and the relationship between government and big business during 2020? Uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very, very happy to be part of this conversation and hearing the perspectives from different CEOs um, across the continent and also from New York, uh, Ellen. Um, I, um, I, when I was first told that I was invited to a virtual lunch, I was actually trying to imagine what a virtual lunch uh, would look like, uh, but it's a, it's a first as well uh, for many of us. Uh, so my name is Claire Akamanzi and I'm the CEO of the Rwanda Development Board. Our organization is in charge of uh, kind of being the link between government and private sector. We promote investments, we facilitate structure and negotiate uh, investments that need uh, government support. And uh, that includes also promoting and attracting uh, growth of tourism. So we are also particularly the, the tourism board in addition to being a development board for investments and, and economic development in general. So uh, three things that I think uh, governments, uh, you know, at least our government has learned from the uh, COVID-19 crisis, and which I think really defines how we should uh, relate to the private sector in a crisis like this. Uh, for us, the first thing has been uh, communicating transparently, not only with the, you know, the staff of RDB for me, but also with all the stakeholders of the economy. Being able to really share the situation as it is, what is COVID-19 status in Rwanda? How many people are sick? Are we ready? Do we have ventilators? Do we have test kits? Where are we struggling? Where can we get all this support so that we can really prepare to fight uh, the pandemic? And we started thinking about this much earlier in the year before we had our first case, but really communicating all the time with the private sector, with, uh, through the private sector federation, Stephen is here and he, he spoke before me, uh, but also really the public, keeping everybody uh, and to understand what the issues are as they are. Uh, so communication was extremely important. It's not a public health issue for just government to deal with. Uh, the public needs to know, do we have chest kits? They need to know what the lockdown means, how long is the lockdown? And also where we didn't know the answers, you know, we told, and the president um, very many times told uh, the public, nobody really knows where this is going or when it's going to end. But the key thing is that we have to prepare, we have to mark, and then we have to hear from the, you know, the, the different stakeholders, what do they need, what are they experiencing, so we can be part of coming up with a solution where we come together. Um, and so uh, as the Rwanda Development Board, we've been part of the National Task Force for COVID-19. And our role there has been getting the voice of the private sector as part of the decision making. And so many decisions had to be made, like lockdown. What would we lock for a business? Who do you allow? What is essential services? How do we allow um, e-commerce to happen? How do we allow banks and insurance companies to continue? So being part of that discussion, being the voice of the private sector, as government was coming up with all these, these new solutions, was really important um, for us as RDB uh, in, in this whole thing of communicating and being um, very transparent about what's going on and also what the challenges are uh, going forward. The second one that we've learned is um, we have to be innovative and agile. Uh, for many of our businesses, you know, somebody was producing clothes or textile and garments for exports and suddenly they don't have the market anymore. Or somebody was exporting fruits and vegetables and they've been, they've, you know, they have their harvest ready and then they cannot export it anymore to Europe where they were exporting. 
Uh, and so really trying to see which businesses can we work with to save some, some, some of it where it's possible. Where do we need to adapt or be flexible? And we saw some new interesting companies that we worked with. For example, we had a company that was uh, exporting um, pesticides. And then suddenly we told them, look, pesticides might be a challenge right now, but we need sanitizers. Can you do something about sanitizers? Within a few weeks, this company was producing sanitizers for the local market. Mm. We did the same thing for, 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 for companies that are in, um, um, in textiles and garments. Yes, you, you know, your orders have been put on hold, but can you make masks? And we, we have more than 6.5 million masks that these local companies made. So that level of being flexible and also supporting e-commerce, digital, motorbikes, for example, because of the lockdown, motorbikes had to, they had no business. And many of our people move around using motorbikes as a public transportation means. But they quickly also turned into delivery services. You know, how do you get restaurants to keep giving uh, food services, but for delivery, not for sitting during the lockdown? And how do you get the motorbike actually deliver this uh, uh, product to people's homes? So being able to innovate and also adjust, but also support um, as a government where necessary. Uh, and I think this takes me to the third and last point, which is advocating for policy changes sometimes. We, wa we had to work with the equivalent of Safaricom in Rwanda and uh, the banks and telecom and telcos to try and make it a little bit more affordable in terms of fees so e-commerce could happen and we could you know, transact more cashless than was the case before. And we also had to go to government and request them, for example, to remove pairs we earn uh, for companies that were really affected um, you know, by, by, by the pandemic and they're trying to keep the jobs of the people. So making it a little bit less difficult by having pairs you earn tax, uh, taxes. So for us, those three things, communicating was very important being innovative and agile about what businesses can still, you know, stay on board and, and keep their revenue streams and keep the jobs coming. And the last part was also really advocating for some policy changes, some flexibility, both from private sector and public sector. And our role as, as Rwanda Development Board was to bring all these pieces together, talk to everybody and try to have solutions that support the, the businesses and private sector. And I think this has to continue even mm. post-COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, Peter, I can see your hand is up. I'm going to bring you in in a second. But I first want to bring in someone who's also part of the conversation, who's a global citizen ambassador, Jeff Hadeb, and of course has been in the South African government with many different roles that he has played since 1994. Thank you so much for also being part of this conversation, uh, Jeff. We really, really do appreciate it. There's way too much to pick up on. Um, you can either tell us what has come up for you thus far in the conversation. Alternatively, there's something that Claire said that's worth picking up on as well. I wonder whether governments have done enough and have been successful in rethinking that relationship with business because during a pandemic, we have got to be stakeholders. Businesses have to repurpose. Maybe you produced pesticides last week, this week. It's something else that's actually useful to us right now. But that requires a sort of tension between government and business to dissipate for the sake of all of our collective well-being. I'd love your thoughts on either that or anything else that has come up for you thus far. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you, Eusebius. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me take this opportunity of thanking you for being uh, such an eminent uh, moderator of this dynamic session and also to thank my esteemed and distinguished panelists for participating in this very important initiative to ensure that we all put our shoulders to the wheel to fight this uh, pandemic that is causing so much havoc across the globe. The main issue that I wanted to address myself to is uh, the issue of the role of global citizen. As you are aware, as you have just indicated that I'm, I'm one of the global citizen ambassadors. Uh, you will recall that last week, uh, on the 28th of May, a global citizen under the patronage of the European Commission uh, launched a very dynamic initiative uh, of Global Goal, Unite for Our Future. I think this discussion, I think, is very much in line with the goals that both the global citizen and the European Commission are committed to. During that launch, even our own president in South Africa, also in his capacity as the chair of the African Union, as well as various presidents across the globe, including France, Germany, Norway, Austria, Belgium, Morocco, uh, New Zealand, 
and various foundations across the planet and and the philanthropists they committed of ensuring that uh, towards the end of this month there must be a global virtual summit where people leaders philanthropists foundations as well as governments they need to commit and make further commitment and pledges to ensure that 7 billion people across the globe have access to tests to treatments and vac- vaccines to ensure that this pandemic can be eradicated. So this summit will take place on the 27th of June. So I also want to use this opportunity of this uh, summit today to call on leaders that are represented here, especially from Africa, to ensure that they, they themselves and their colleagues in business, they also commit to all these commitments and pledges in the fight against uh, the COVID-19. You will recall, uh, distinguished panelists, that uh, sometime about a month ago, global citizens, together with the World Health Organization, organized a very dynamic uh, 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 function that was uh, held across the globe called One World Together at Home event, which was viewed by more than 270 million people and it also raised funds to the tune of $127 million. So that's an indication and reflection of how uh, global citizens working with all stakeholders, business, labor, and organs of civil society, we can be able to fight this fight of ensuring that we can be able to succeed in fighting this invisible enemy. So we also want to use this forum as well to appeal to colleagues uh, here to support this initiative and ensuring that we're able to fight this uh, pandemic wherever it it has its ugly head. But uh, uh, taking advantage as well as a South African Mm. uh, who we have been fighting racism for many decades, uh, I think it would be remiss of me if I just don't make just one comment on what is happening in the United States and other parts of the world uh, arising uh, from uh, the the killing of a black man in Minneapolis uh, by by a a police officer, that we as global citizens, we stand for justice. We stand for equality of opportunities. So we we feel that uh, the United States government, any governments across the, the globe, they must stand up to fight this injustice. And as global citizens, we stand with you in this fight against the pandemic. So those will be my uh, opening remarks, uh, Eusebius and Mm. and distinguished panelists uh, in this uh, summit. Thank you, Jeff. And um, I don't know if you were listening to the beginning of the day, but Prof. Kramer did exactly the same. He said it was very important that we anchor this conversation today by making sure that concepts like shared value and leadership intersect with what happens socially in the world and you can't have this conversation today and not um, reflect on what is happening the fire this time uh, in america to borrow from a james baldwin title and give it a contemporary feel peter i think you had your hand up um let's go straight to you yeah thank you thank you for having me again um uh, peter uh, from from safaricom Yeah, I just wanted to just make a few points, uh, probably to build on some of what has been said. And and, and kind of, I think uh, it is you, um, you you said, yes, who said, uh, what is the reason to believe that this is this is different? Uh, And and I think uh, it was Faith who said that actually we are all we are we are all affected. Um, I think there's there's an opportunity to to use this as a, a momentum. Uh, to build on the reason why purpose is important, mm. uh, and and I think just like we've uh, we've been driving uh, diversity as a big topic around the world, uh, and we know more diverse organisations are actually more successful. We need to uh, and, and 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 for us in Safaricom, we've seen that, that purpose-driven organisations are actually much more ambitious, much more successful. Uh, investors, I was speaking to investors recently, and I only joined on the 1st of uh, April in the middle of the crisis. Uh, I was speaking to investors, and, and investors are thinking about how, what are you doing to go beyond uh, delivering profit? And because they are thinking 
This is not about short term. These investors are investing uh, in emerging markets in the long term. And so the why or purpose uh, and the reason why it is uh, it helps our business is an important, I, I don't know whether it's in education, but actually I think we can use this uh, at this crisis to really get people to understand why purpose actually makes sense. Uh, and, and, and if you have purpose, you're, you're more likely to, to do a lot more and be more sustainable. And then it is what it does it makes you do. Uh, so during this crisis, for example, in Safaricom, uh, we have a product, uh, we, we have a loyalty uh, scheme called Bonga for good. Uh, sorry, Bonga points, which is loyalty points you get for buying airtime ETC. So during that time, we said instead of giving airtime, and you are still, you, you can still uh, redeem you, your Bonga points uh, for uh, for airtime, but we said Bonga for good. So so you can donate them to someone else to buy food or to buy essential services or to, to pay something that is important. So it makes you innovate because our purpose in Safaricom is about transforming life. And, and if you look at the impact that, say, M-Pesa has had about transforming lives, it, today is used by every adult in this country. Uh, it is uh, transformed financial inclusion from 20s to 80s now. People who never have uh, wanted to, I mean, had never have accessed a bank. During this COVID crisis, we made uh, transfers below uh, 1,000 shillings, which is $10 free, and we've seen 20 million people use it. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that, that the piece around connecting your business, what you do, to what you, what you create in society can make a material difference. So, so, so we are using M-Pesa, for example, to transfer money to people who are vulnerable uh, so, 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 to, so that we support them during this period. because. Transporting food is, is not possible during this time. So, so I think it's about, it's about connecting what you do to serve it rather than just being, being generous. Uh, it's about making money and, and changing society and creating, reducing inequality. So there's a real sweet spot if you do it for a long time and if it is in the DNA of the organization. But yeah. it requires leadership. Uh, leadership is a, is a key ingredient for en ensuring that Year on year, purpose is alive. That's such a beautiful point. Hilton, you've got your hand up. Before you did, you were just by a nanosecond beaten to it by Ife Inua. I mangled your name the first time and you were very kind. Um, I want to learn to say it properly. I hope you mangle mine and then we are square, but I don't think you did. Um, how do I say your name properly? Such a beautiful name. What does it mean, by the way? and it means there's nothing like a child. So what does it mean again? There's nothing like a child. Oh, that's absolutely gorgeous. One of the horrible <laughs> things about being an adult is that we grow up, some of us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, funnily, I think it keys into to what I was going to share, my views on, on the essence of purpose. <clears throat> and it's, it's really connecting to our humanness. You know, so there's nothing like being a human being. We are all human beings. And that is what we need to connect to in order to, to, to have purpose and to live our purpose in life. And to remember that organizations are made up of human beings. And if everyone would take the personal responsibility of connecting to their core and their purpose, then we, we would have a, a shared value, not just a government level, a private sector, public sector, all around. Purpose, from our perspective, simply means leaving the world better than how you found it. Mm. And that could be in terms of the environment, in terms of other human beings around you. If we can always look at life from that perspective, we would find that everything we do would be steeped in purpose. Mm. But unfortunately, we find that we're often only looking at things from our perspective, sometimes even act acting out of fear. Most of the the, the, the wrongs or the crimes that have been committed against humanity have been from a place of fear. And we all are guilty in little ways throughout uh, the year. So as organizations, how do we make our decisions? What are the, motivate, the key motivating factors to decisions that we make? How are we impacting the environment? How are we impacting other people? I remember when the lockdown had just started. Um, talking about sharing purpose with your team. You know, we were all working from home. 
And this particular staff meeting we had, I could sense the fear. I could sense the uncertainty. There were so many questions. There was just so much fear. What is going on? How, when is this going to end? Are we safe? I'm not even safe going outside. And I, at the, by the end of that meeting, what we had done was to shift our focus away from our safety, our personal safety, and our personal, uh, what's going to happen to us, to, okay, how can we support our entrepreneurs? How can we help uh, the people down the road who don't have food to eat? Because as I mentioned earlier, food security was one of the major issues. And so we began to find little pockets of people organizing, uh, uh, packing food and giving out, and, uh, you know, started thinking of innovative ways to support our entrepreneurs, even though we were all working remotely. And the energy changed from that meeting. And after that, there was never any talk of fear, never any talk of uh, uh, worry. It was so much energy, so much positivity because we were focused on others. And I think that is the key takeaway for me through this amazing session that's been organized is that if we can only hold on to our purpose, our shared value in terms of how am I impacting the other? If we can always remember that we are connected and when you remember you're connected to someone, you can't do things to harm that person. And so I think that uh, very clearly uh, what's important is for us to remember that we are all connected and our, our, our role as human beings is to bring humanness into all our activities and to leave the world a better place than we found. That's absolutely beautiful. Hilton, I want to give you two challenges. Share with us whatever is in your thought bubble that made you raise your hand digitally. But I also want to push the envelope here. We are almost by definition in this conversation on the cushy side of the income and asset and wealth inequalities on our continent. And I wonder if our commitment to even the idea of shared value that has been reiterated so many times in this conversation would be shared by your customers, by the small and medium businesses that perhaps are part of your value chain that supply to you, by the people who walk in and out of your offices as your staff members as well. Um, so we're not shaming or auditing you. It is a conversation between leaders. But as the moderator, I've got to ask that question. I just had to switch off my phone here because I... I got a message from one of your Discovery staff members that needs to have a conversation with me about my chronic medication. And I'm thinking to myself, I hope this person is not going to try and convince me to get a generic version because my doctor has taken a clinical decision. And if you are sitting somewhere uh, remote from the doctor's office, you can't take a decision like that. So I'm, doing, I'm getting ready mentally to do battle at one minute after two with one of your staff members. So what I'm suggesting is that if we are very honest, whatever you say, whatever each one of you say in this conversation, I have got to measure it as an analyst against the empirical reality of people that don't have the same power as you and I do. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually lead off with the, with the, actual, with the um, example that you've just given. Um, now, I don't know what... The, the call to you is, uh, is in respect of <laughs> I don't what, to you, what we have been doing is one of the things that we've seen over, over the last uh, couple of months is, is, and this is an interesting insight, is that a lot of our, our members who otherwise would have gone to pharmacies, would have gone and got their chronic medication, are now too scared to do so. Mm. You know, they're, they're staying at home. Mm. They're staying away from uh, really necessary health care that, that they should be obtaining um, in, and, and, you know, I think it was one of the points that Ellen made. You know, we, we're actually seeing an increase in incidence of, of other non-COVID um, illnesses, and that's, that's, that's something that's really concerning. So what we have started to do, actually, is to reach out to our members, to our clients who are on chronic medications. If they haven't taken them, if they're falling behind, mm. we're proactively reaching out to them um, and sending them the, uh, and delivering to their homes, keeping them at home, but at the same time ensuring that they get their medication. So, so I hope that that's the that's the reason because it is it sort of it goes back to 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 maybe the the, the previous point, um, uh, which was raised uh, I think by Peter and Yefenyuma, where where the point was made around purpose. Now our purpose was defined 25 years ago. It was at the time pretty fluffy and pretty simple. It was make people healthier. Now 
as an insurer, it was based on the insight that only governments or insurers can monetize better health. Yeah. And yeah. that's the that's the sort of the insight that rather than paying for sickness, we we had the sort of the, the vision and the uh, and and the sort of purpose to make people healthier and rather avoid the sickness in the first place. If you mm. can do that, mm. you can have a profound impact. You can make people live longer, bring down the cost of healthcare, you can use it much more, much more effectively. Um, and that's what's guided us through this process. You know, I think in the context of COVID, I suppose in many respects, having a purpose of making people healthier and driving behavior change and driving the right behaviors mm. through that process, which are good for good for society, good for our clients, um, good for the public, but also good for us as an organization, is what I think shared value is really is really about. And 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 I think the 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 reason why um, hopefully businesses will change. Uh, will come out of this pandemic in a much stronger position in societies as a result is that there needs to be an alignment between business and between society and between our clients. And and I think the point's been made, you know, I think CSI is good, it's important, um, but but it's not necessarily sustainable. And I think we're going to see that now. You know, as businesses come under immense financial pressure and strain, I, I hope it doesn't happen, but often the first areas to get cut in discretionary spend uh, charity, marketing, you know, sort of the, the easy areas to cut. And that'll be a terrible thing. Shared value doesn't require that. You know, in fact, it's entirely scalable and encourages businesses to invest more and in so doing, you know, sort of completely align with clients. So, so in our case, our purpose did drive every single action. It drove what we did with our staff, make them healthier, protect them, um, to, to the point of, you know, I thought I was inspired by the, the example of staff yeah. sort of staying yeah. and sleeping over. We, we didn't do quite that, but we, we hired hundreds of cars. You know, we've got, uh, we've got a great partnership with one of the car hire companies. Their cars were lying dormant. We went and, and took over literally hundreds of them for our staff so that the, the frontline workers didn't have to take public transport and had their own vehicles through this, uh, through this period. Mm. So, so there are ways that you can do that in a, a way, you know, that, that, that really does, that, that protects staff. So that was first and foremost what we did. And then um, we released our virtual consultation platform, which I think has potential not just in South Africa, um, where we do have the benefits of, of I think, you know, obviously a, on average, a wealthier um, uh, society than, than perhaps the rest of Africa. But the the, uh, the the technology is entirely scalable and transportable, and and we've seen that playing out. That you know we've made available um, our virtual consultation platform, which is available to our clients, but we made it available to the whole country Absolutely. with hundreds of thousands of GP consultations um, that are protect the GP, they're able to consult virtually and, and, the, and the patient and, uh, and, uh, and the person who's seeking the care. And that, that kind of technology doesn't have to, be, um, doesn't have to stop at our borders. Absolutely. You know, that can be available across the whole continent. Mm. And that's the, that's the sort of, the, I think, the opportunities that through this period um, we, have to, we have to capitalize on that borders um, can be broken down um, through sort of purpose, goodwill, um, and good faith between between companies, government, and society. And Thanks, I'm going to follow up in your chronic condition. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. When I return that call later, I will truthfully say to one of your employees, sorry I couldn't answer you. I was busy having lunch with Hilton, one of your CEOs. What can I do for you? And then see how the conversation goes after that. Um, there's so much there to pick up on. Thank you for that. Very incisive. Um, I think you had your hand up, Ellen. Did you want to come in? Oh, um, I actually, I had. I was I've been having trouble with the hand raising function since the beginning, so I had my hand up at the beginning. Okay, before you come um, in, I just want to just. Yeah, Ellen, before you come in, let me just say this, right? I mean, this conversation is so beautiful. I initially worried as a moderator, oh my God, two hours is too long. We've got too many people and it's flowing so amazingly. You're making my job quite easy. Can I ask us to do the following? In addition to having the dynamic conversation on the current issues, feel free to pick up on the last important issue that I'm going to throw into the mix and just let it simmer in your subconscious. What are the most important priorities that CEOs need to have going forward? I listened very carefully to Prof. Porter earlier, and he was making the point that unless whatever your purpose is, is connected to your strategy, and I would be even more practical, unless something is one of the top five priorities of a CEO, 
even your KPIs that a board hold you accountable by, it's unlikely that it will get the necessary investment, literally, your time investment, monetary investment, creative energy, strategic investment. So let's stick with this conversation. But because we only have 20 minutes left, feel free to also jump from the current conversation and begin to tell me what you think are one or two of the top five priorities CEOs need to be thinking about. You don't need to have five. It can be one, it can be five. Um, but let's also, let's also just transition into that conversation as we near the end of this beautiful webinar. Ellen, go ahead. My apologies. Well, I'll pick up there. That's, I think, a really important thing to focus on is what as CEOs are we doing going forward? One of the best quotes I heard recently was, uh, being a CEO is not about being in charge, but taking care of the people in your charge. And I think that is your staff. That's the communities that you focus on. And I'm thinking here in this webinar, I just put a note in the side chat that I was like, actually, none of us can accomplish our organizational purpose and mission alone, even with the staff that we have. I know from my position, there are over 500 million people in Africa that need treatment for one or more neglected tropical disease. That's not going to be solved by the NTD program managers and ministries of health. It's Health is not only something that should be um, addressed by people within the health sector. I was thinking that after uh, this, if we had been in person for this panel, we would be exchanging cards and thinking about how could we help each other with our, our, our goals and purpose for each other's mission. We're probably going to have to figure out ways for these sort of webinars to continue to do that and ask the organizers to share contact information because we are still, what I worry about is that you can continue relationships in this environment. But it's very hard to expand relationships in this environment where we're used to all being out there as CEOs, especially connecting. And I think as CEOs, you especially have the, the responsibility and opportunity to be connecting with people outside of your own organization. You have this internal facing role, but you also think you have a vision of how you fit within the broader society and the broader sector. And so I really think about like those new ways to communicate, new ways to connect um, and, and a real clarity about what are tangible things that we could move. I mean, I, I feel really optimistic and excited that we can continue progress on within the next, de next decade, reducing the burden of neglected tropical diseases in Africa by 90%. Mm. People do not have to grow up with intestinal worms. They don't have to grow up, you know, worried about Bill Harzio holding them back and creating early death. Um, and I just think that those tangible wins are things that we can all get around. And it's and it's part, and I find myself, I mean, I am passionate about ending neglect and tropical diseases, but I, I spend part of my time mentoring and supporting CEOs from other social sector organizations, making introductions that have nothing to do with the work that I'm doing, but just because we know we can all be a connector. And that that um, generosity network really is generosity of sharing your time, sharing your network, and seeing how can we let resources and, and energy flow to where they can have the most connections. And I, I keep thinking about your comment earlier in the session about like, why don't we, why aren't we learning these lessons over and over again? Why do we think back to September 11th or World War II or far beyond that? Why don't we learn it? And I think there is something, um, you know, as was mentioned, deeply human about this process. Like everybody is in this process of waking. Everybody is in this process, this journey of, 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 of becoming fully human and living our full potential. And that has to happen over the, at the, at the level of the individual and at the level of the individual person's life. And so I think that can't happen as a solo journey. All of us are collectively responsible for helping each other with our purpose, with our mission, for waking up to what is possible. Um, so I just really have been inspired and honored to be a part of this conversation today and looking forward to ways of taking it forward. Okay, who wants to jump, jump in next? Priorities for CEOs. We can extend that question, Jeff, not just CEOs in the business sense, but also within government. I mean, this is a profound moment of leadership um, challenge for government at the moment. We've seen it on a daily basis. One week, the president is loved. The next week, he gets trolled. One week, a minister, is, a scientist is loved. The next week, they get trolled again. It's a really difficult time to sustain trust in leadership in all parts of, of, of our lives, whether it be within the business sector or government. Okay, we'll try and get the audio right there before we come back to Jeff. I can't hear you at all. In the meantime, I want to hear from you, Faith, and then Ian, I'm going to come to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yusuf, again. Uh, my thoughts on uh, basically what the top uh, five priorities should be, I'm not going to name the five, 
But I really think that, you know, as CEOs, we have to embrace, and I'm, I'm going to steal this term from some American business guru, we have to embrace stakeholder capitalism. Because, you know, because this is really what, uh, you know, purpose leadership, in my view, is about. It's about caring, not just for the bottom line or just for the shareholders. It's really about, you know, caring for all the stakeholders uh, that make your, you know, your business um, a success. But again, I think, uh, you see, it starts with self. I really think that, you know, leaders have to go back to being selfless. They have to go back to being uh, caring uh, individuals because, you know, they've got a huge responsibility to care for, you know, for people that, you know, work for them, for customers, for suppliers, for communities. So I think it's, it, it, and, and, and I actually like what uh, if, if Feinua said, it, it, we have, leaders have to go back to being human and really caring and being compassionate because, this thing of, you know, consumption for self alone, you see, because it's just not sustainable. You know, you really have to care, you know, um, you know, for others. But I think uh, lastly, I want to give my other colleagues also an opportunity. We, I think we also, as leaders, we have to embrace innovation. We have to embrace change. You know, we need to be opening up, you know, to ideas. Because I think what we're saying uh, as a panel today is that the status quo that was there, you know, three months ago, four months ago, before COVID, has to be shaken up. Mm -hmm. But for us to shake up the status quo, we really have to shake up our, our minds. You know, we need to, you know, to rethink, to reset, and we must embrace change, and we must listen to to everyone, um, you know, not just our, our staff, but also our customers, our suppliers, you know, so that we can get ideas uh, that we can then input into our business strategies so that, you know, uh, at the end of this um, challenging period, we can really have solutions that are, embra are all embracing and are all uh, inclusive. Uh, so that's really, those are my thoughts, uh, Eusebius. Okay, thank you. thank you for that, Faith. Jeff, yeah. let's see whether we can hear you properly now. I think the mic was on mute, but uh, just make sure your side, it is also not muted. Otherwise, your wisdom is going to be a soliloquy with an audience of one. And uh, we, we want to make sure that you have a real audience. Uh, so let's see whether I can hear you now. Go ahead, sir. Alas, I can still not hear you. I'm not sure if it's our side or your side. Just make sure that you haven't muted yourself. Hello, can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. It's very rare for a politician to take a vow of silence. <laughs> you say, yes. I was saying that uh, I've, I've been very much inspired by all the speakers who were emphasizing the point of humanness. Mm. In my language here in South Africa, we call it Ubuntu. Humanity, humanness. Mm. Ubuntu. Umuntu, umuntu ngabantu, you are a person because of other persons. Mm. So in other words, if we talk about shared values, what I've learned through this COVID-19 is the importance of life and humanity. In other words, with the embracing of innovation and the fourth industrial revolution, the world will never be the same again. So it is possible, therefore, that going forward, there will be a time where we'll, never, we'll not be able to go back to the traditional form of work. So what happens to those millions of people across the globe who are being ravaged by poverty, unemployment and poverty? So I think this calls upon those in power, in government, in business, and labor and civil society to come together to form a pact that it is possible, therefore, mm. that there will be people who will not be able to get the opportunities that will be brought about by this fourth industrial revolution. So the issue of a basic income grant, I think it is at the core of this shared values that we need to think about as society that we need to pay in order to ensure for the sustainability of humanity as a whole. 
Absolutely. So this also yeah. lies. Mm. It also lies at the heart of what we as global citizens are standing for because we support mm. the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, of the community of nations, mm. that uh, we need to leave no stone unturned in fighting extreme forms of poverty. Humanity, humanness, Ubuntu, I think is a cardinal principle that must be universally embraced. Beautifully put. Couldn't agree with you more. And that's a critically important value that we can export to the rest of the world. Rebecca, let's go to you next. Uh, I, I, re I see everyone else who has their hands up. And don't worry, I'm going to make sure each one has got at least 90 seconds before we wrap up in the next 10 minutes. Rebecca, over to you. Thank you, Eusebius. When I was looking at the priorities for leaders, I had such a long list. I had research, innovation, many things. But I would like to start with um, employee engagement. And we have to quickly align the shared values, the purpose of the organization with what the employees believe. And we have to close that gap because then it is futile for an, on a, an organization to have shared values and purpose that is not supported by its own ambassadors. Mm. And looking at this crisis, and in line with what everybody else has said, the importance of humanity, adaptability, reclassification of jobs, looking at the jobs that earlier on were seen as lowly, probably not important, and the turn of events, that those jobs are actually critical, the cleaning jobs, the nursing jobs. And in this regard, I also want to recognize that inclusivity is extremely important. We see some of these jobs that were classified as lowly and with other terms are also performed by women. And we need to really bring the gender balance and show that everybody then performs a very critical role. And together with that is stakeholder engagement. Everybody around our businesses must also be aligned with our shared values. When we call, when we have things like whistleblower policies, anti-corruption policies, we must align our business, our employees, and our stakeholders. I've also seen business continuity and the sheer preparedness to handle disaster is really critical. We have to look at that seriously because it's a, a survival strategy and every organization and leaders should have proactive strategies. And I have seen that COVID has marshaled all the other disasters to accompany it. For example, in our country, COVID did not spare us from flooding. It did not spare us from locusts and many other things. And we've got to have ways of handling even multiple disasters and crises. And that will ensure business continuity and also continuity of life. Absolutely. Also yeah. seen, mm. We all need to know that we are all specs. The issue of humanity, we can be wiped out anytime. And we've got to remove this notion that there are people who are probably more human than the other. And this, I think, is an equalizer and a final point to nail down on the issue of humanity. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. There's so much that you've said there that is absolutely beautiful. If I had to take a screenshot just of us in conversation and the nine faces there, that is not the picture of the boardroom in North America, nor here in Africa. So we are already through Tiki Barnard here and her leadership role modeling the kind of change that we need to see. It's amazing how the people who are disproportionately affected by boardroom and governmental decisions often don't have a seat at the table. And it's very difficult to not notice the diversity commitment to this particular week and not just today's summit as well. One minute each, uh, Stephen and Peter. Stephen, I'm going to start with you. Thank you so much. Once again, allow me to say thank you to the organizers of this event. It's really uh, insightful, and I have learned one or two so many other things to do. If you allow me directly to go to the question, uh, we don't have to have a, a number of priorities. One or two is enough as long as there has to be of us. 
Right now, what I see is important from my personal perspective and the organization is unity. Holding the organization together, having all stakeholders at the same page, uh, creating certainty. As long as we are one, we shall have overcome the, this, this challenge. There is no winner or loser in this scenario. It, there is no, either we win or we lose this scenario, but either we should come out of this uh, crisis as winners, not as victims, not as the, the, the people who didn't participate greatly. The other, uh, probably other priority is to change the working strategy. It is no longer the business as usual. A number of things are changing. Uh, markets are going to have disruptions. People are going to do much inward looking. Workers are scared of their next uh, job security. Companies are not sure of the market. So what are the strategies that we're going to have to one, to come out of this uh, COVID crisis and to sustainability and creating more values? Uh, lastly, we have to encourage creativity and innovation. Uh, my colleague mentioned about innovation, but this is the time to entertain, give space, creativity and innovation. The reason being that we have to get measures post COVID and what will happen uh, in the future. The COVID has taught me one lesson that the world is rather connected than disconnected. It is easy to think you will not be the victim, uh, the crisis would not reach you, but this has shown us there is no superpower in uh, the virus pandemic. Everyone will be affected. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Peter, 60 seconds starts now. Um, I, I think I echo everyone, uh, what everyone has said in terms of this is a great, uh, great forum uh, to share ideas. So, so for me, there the are a number of things that uh, the CEO and myself included should, should think about. One is reimagine the future, but reimagine the futures are connected rather than, uh, rather than um, apart. You know, like there is, there's a there's a very important uh, uh, kind of saying we we are we are we are running a safaricom, although we are apart, uh, we, we 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 although we are apart, you are ap we are apart, you are not alone. Mm. Uh, so we need to make sure that people don't feel that they have been left behind. So so supporting the community during this period is going to be important. The second is is actually thinking about collaborating in the recovery phase. And one of the big areas that we are thinking about, especially given the role it plays, is SMEs, supporting SMEs uh, to actually come back because that's where how employment will come back. And it is only, this is one, one of the reasons why I think shared, shared uh, value is big. So SMEs will be, will be an important. And then also thinking about the future of an organization. So the future of work uh, being a space, not, uh, not a place. Uh, thinking about health and mental and well-being of people, think about resilience, both both for the, for the business but also supply chain, but also one of the big areas that, uh, especially as a technology company, we are thinking about is education and access to Absolutely. education. How do we leverage te technology hmm. uh, going forward? We're going to draw this lunch to an end. I just want you to stay put uh, for three, four minutes as we do exactly that. Firstly, I want to thank every single one of you for participating in the CEO lunch today. The insights are way too many. I think they are irreducibly complex and innumerous, which is a gift to all of the attendees who are listening, wherever they may be from in the rest of the world. It is critically important that we take stakeholder theory and engagement seriously. I loved what Jeff had said about Ubuntu as a fundamental foundation upon which we can build the other more precise leadership challenges. And then in each of your businesses, I am delighted that, for example, you do not see your employees as subjects, but as co-creators of a future in which the shareholders are having to recognize that their fate from a business point of view is tied together with the fate of every single employee that creates value that then needs to be shared. That's really important. And as if that's not enough, one of my many um, points that I love, because I think it's so unique to us as human beings, as a species, is that we have creativity. 
We often forget the extent of our creativity combined with language is what sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom, and how we leverage that to try and deal with crisis is critically important. So thank you, thank you, thank you for this successful first virtual summit, and um, I'm sure that uh, those in the other regions like Australia will be delighted to know that it's gone off well. Australia will have a similar shared value virtual summit on June the 10th, um, but we in Africa often seen as a net importer of technology, as I've said earlier, that is historically false. Sometimes we also start a trend and the rest of the world simply does a better PR job. Last but not least, I want to invite back the interim CEO, Ian Williamson from the old Mutual Group. Ian, once again, Honestly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for the role that uh, you are playing, not just today, but also the focus on transforming the healthcare in Africa, young entrepreneurs um, on day three, as well as unlocking the power of innovation. So it's an entire week of activity that has been planned, but day one has been an enormous success, and I now invite you in closing to say a couple of words. Thank you, CBS. And um, unfortunately, I would miss some context because I had a technology problem earlier in the conversation. So I missed some of it, but I think I, I've got most of it. And what I have heard, I must say, was greatly uplifting and very encouraging. Um, you know, especially after the events of this last weekend and the last few weeks with the George Floyd incident in the US, with the incident around Collins Causa locally in South Africa. And I think with with um, some of the smaller things, you know, there was a message from the Nelson Mandela Foundation this morning coming out saying, you know, they've got a, a program aimed at supplying food to to those in need in the community. And the amount of sort of petty bureaucratic interference with their activities is quite disheartening. So... I found today really quite uplifting after all of that. Mm. And I, I do think that ultimately, not for CEOs, but just for leaders everywhere, that really I, I think the critical role right now at this juncture is to make sure we take the path of, that's been described in this conversation. Uh, you know, because I think COVID is putting pressure on everybody. And that pressure is resulting in, I think, quite a... Um, binary response. It's either the petty, small-minded, I'm going to look after myself kind of piece of the response, or it's the inclusive compact, we're all in this together, and actually we need to emerge from the stronger together at the end of this process. And I think our role as leaders is to make sure that we adopt the latter path and not the former path. And to do everything that we can to influence those who, who, who sometimes make the really big decisions to make sure that we do go there. Mm. So that would be my call for all of us. But I really want to thank all the panelists for a fantastic and uplifting conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you so much for your leadership, for the leadership of Old Mutual. Thank you for the rest of the sponsored Abbott KCB group as well. And of course, the Shared Value, Vef Shared Value Africa initiative. I also want to say thank you to people who often don't get thanked in case there's no opportunity later in the week, which is for Tiki and her team. There's an amazing technical team here that is responsible for you being able to um, see me looking more decent than I should be uh, because everything is working so fluently uh, in our makeshift of green room that we have here in Johannesburg and this team has been working for a very long time to bring you this particular summit.